Gospel reading this morning comes from Luke, the first chapter, beginning at verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, to the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him to the throne of his David ancestor, to his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Our gracious God, as we come to you this morning, we come with humble hearts, recognizing once more the mystery of your presence in our lives. That the promise of this Christmas season is a promise for you to be with us, to live among us, and to be a part of us. We pray especially for each and every one as we gather this coming week as family and friends. But we also remember, dear Lord, those who are alone, those who have no one, those who have lost loved ones, those whose family members may be far away in service or someplace else, who may not have the means to come home. We pray, dear God, for them as well. Help all of us to realize, dear Lord, no matter our station in life, that you come to us, offering us the promise of your gift. Help us to have open hearts and receptive minds. In Christ's name, amen. Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and uh, next Sunday, as we've mentioned, is Christmas Sunday. Four Sundays in Advent. Usually the first Sunday you deal with the second coming. Then you have two Sundays dealing with John the Baptist, and we've gone through that, and now we're dealing with the fourth Sunday, and that talks about Mary and uh, the, re the, re the realization that she was going to bear the Christ child. The problem as we get ready for Christmas and all of it, its uh, efforts is that sometimes we lose the meaning that Christ has for us. It gets lost in all of the busyness of life. It gets lost in all of the pressures to do everything and please everyone and be the perfect host and have all the gifts it gets lost in the pageantry of the season. And if we're not careful, we can come to next Sunday morning and the spirit of Christmas will evade us once more and we will not experience what Christ has promised for us. The difficulty is that we fail to understand what originally took place, what happened. Because if you look at the story from its original perspective, if you see what really took place, it is a miracle story that offers hope for each of us. It is a story of how God chose to become a part of our lives, to identify with us and guide us in our living. And he chose to do that in the most humble of ways. We think of all the pageantry and we think of all the, the, the images that surround Christmas. But on that first Christmas, none of that was there. There was a simple peasant girl by the name of Mary, who historians think may have been 13 or 14 years of age. She was 
given in marriage by her family to Joseph. It was an arranged marriage. This wasn't Romeo and Juliet. This wasn't young love. This was simply a way that Mary could be taken care of and provided for as she became an adult in that culture. So Mary, who had absolutely no standing whatsoever, was simply a young peasant girl, was chosen by God to bear that Christ child. And we look at the, the setting. Israel was an occupied land. The Roman government had been there for years, and it exerted its power and its influence, and people were hungry for deliverance. They were hungry for freedom, and they were oppressed, and they didn't have the freedom that they wanted. They had been promised a Messiah. They knew that one was going to come, but they had no idea how or when or where. And so in the midst of that setting, you get a picture of how God comes into our hearts and our lives. It's not the pageantry. It's not the music singing. It's not the angels. It's not those things that we often think about at Christmas. It's that lowly, forlorn, forsaken, forgotten, second class, overlooked, insignificant, nobody in the middle of nowhere that God reaches out and touches. That is a message that we need to hear again. Because we're living in a world that we are coming to the place where we think that the economy solves all of our problems. People are praying for a good shopping season. Because if that's done well, then the world will be fine. Well, it will certainly help a lot of people, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it will not solve the, the world's problems. The world's problems will not be solved by a strong economy. They are solved when we allow ourselves to be touched by God's spirit, God's love, God's presence in our hearts and our lives. As I said, Israel was an occupied land, and people were oppressed and depressed as they realized the kind of life that they were living. And it was so interesting these past few days and weeks to hear the forecast and the newscast to tell us that today optimism in America is at an all-time low. That poverty continues to increase and that the hopes and dreams of so many people are being dashed because they haven't got the security that they once had. And all of that is changing. Our world is in flux, and we need to see what's going on around us. And we sometimes think, well, if I just spend a little more, maybe that'll solve the problem. But it won't. We live in a world filled with sin. We live in a world filled with evil. We live in a world where we're not taking care of each other the way God has asked us to do. We're more concerned for ourselves first. And so God challenges our faith, and he wants us to break out of that, to be a nation that loves God truly in our hearts and to do the right thing. But it's more than just that. It's that personal problems that we face as well. For really, this story is a story about impossibilities, who would have thought that Mary, a 13-year-old girl, a peasant girl in the hills of Judea, would bear the Christ child? And who could ever think that God might come into our hearts and our lives with our problems and our situations? Because I know on Sunday morning we all clean up and we put on a nice Sunday morning face and we all come to church and we're all happy and glad to see each other and we shake one another's hands and give a few hugs, and everything is wonderful. But I will confess to you, I know that sometimes when you go home, all hell breaks loose. And life isn't always pleasant. And there are problems that we are struggling with. And we don't know what to do with our children, and we don't know what to do with our 
with our income and our job. We don't know what to do with all of the pressures that are mounting upon us, and we're thinking, God, how in the world can this ever change? And maybe that's why we need to hear this word today. Because Mary asked a simple question. Lord, how can this be? I'm a virgin. This isn't going to happen, Lord. It should amaze us. In fact, it should always humble us to realize that God's ways are not our ways. And God can do as God pleases to do. And God is bigger than we are. And he's bigger than our problems. If the church needs to do anything today, it needs to humble itself and to realize that it's not about us, it's about God. And that God wants us to be servants, God wants us to be followers, God wants us to be messengers and ambassadors, God wants us to be those elements of grace and peace in this sin-sick world that would offer people hope for their lives. That God loves them even as they are in the midst of all the struggles of life that they are going through. And so while we project a wonderful image, God sees our hearts. He knows who we are on the inside. He knows about our fears. He knows about our anger. He knows about our disappointments. He knows about our hopes and our dreams. He knows who we are. And you know the good news is he loves us. He loves us. And that gift of Christmas comes to us. And Mary asked the question, Lord, how can this be? And the angel gives the explanation that with God, God can do and God can be and God will be available. And then she says something most important. Here I am, your servant. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? Isn't it when we surrender our will to God's will? Isn't it when we say, I'm tired of trying to do it by myself and I want God to guide and lead me? Isn't it when we simply say, I am your servant? And when we do that, God can break into our hearts and our lives. And the miracles that we thought could never happen, the relationships that can be restored, the dreams that can be fulfilled, the hope that can be realized can be a part of our lives once more as we reprioritize and reorder our lives to see that what the world has been selling us isn't worth it. It's empty. You can unwrap all of the packages in the world and Christmas will not be there. So we have to be open to that surprise. We have to be open to how God wants to use us. I read the story of a professor that came home one evening and was going through his stack of mail on his desk and as he was going through it, a magazine fell off to the floor and opened up to an article. He picked it up, he looked at the article and it said that there were mission needs in the Congo. He thought, well, that's strange, and he looked at the magazine and looked at who it was sent to and it wasn't even sent to him. It had been misdirected. He looked back at that article and again and he said, Something within me clicked and I knew exactly what I needed to do with my life. And so he told his wife, we're going to the Congo. And that's the story of David Schweitzer, who answered the call when God surprised him in a way that he had never expected. This Christmas, I hope every single one of us experience the true presence of Christ 
in a way that gives us a joy that this world will never be able to give, and a peace and an awareness of God's presence and love. Because without that, we are nothing. This past week, I received a quote from Sandra that I fully appreciate and I want to share with you now. It's simply this. Until you have Christmas in your heart, you will not have Christmas under your tree. I hope and pray all of us have Christmas in our heart this season. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.